is. Take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> hey guys, can you hear me okay? Yes. Cool. So um, my name is Ethan Sergal, like John said. Uh, the talk tonight is on class-based views in Django, which are, they bring a lot of power to the table, but they're also pretty complicated. They're kind of a controversial topic because of that. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to know, um, just sort of get a feel of your general experience. So who here has written a website in Django before? Okay. Um, and who here has used Python at all? Like in, knows like object-oriented programming in Python, like that kind of thing. Okay, uh, cool. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so to start off, um, so views primarily accept a request from a client and do some logic behind the scenes and return a response. So they're sort of the main point where you interact with the client. You know, everything else goes through views. There are other things too, but that's, this is sort of like the core principle for interaction. Um, so this top example here, this is a functional view, and many of you have probably seen these in Django tutorial. If you haven't followed the Django tu tu tutorial, that's a, it's a really good introduction. So um, functional view, you can see there, couldn't be simpler. It just is a function that literally accepts a request and returns a response. Um, great. So class-based view here, a little bit longer, still pretty simple uh, for this, you know, hello world example. Um, so um, there's a get method being defined here where, and that's what actually accepts the request and returns the response. And it's sort of a little bit magic at this point, like how, how that actually works, whereas the functional view is totally clear, like you can see the whole point of execution. Um, so that's just sort of the general difference between the two of those. Um, so with functional views though, you, you do see a lot of repeated control logic. So especially with forms when you're dealing with the things like that, you know, if you have a post request, you want to do one thing, and if you have a get request, you want to do another thing, and you end up with these like really big long views. Um, so you can also uh, separate it out and just sort of have, you know, like, oh, this is the version of the view if it's a post request, or this is if it's a get request, or you can modularize it in other ways, or you can have different URLs for each of those requests, you know, things like that. Um, but with, uh, with class-based views, that's, that's actually built into to the idea of it. So um, when you define a get request, or a, a get method, that's what gets called on a get request, and a post method gets called on a post request. And this is actually true for you know put, delete, and like all those other HTTP verbs. But um, these are the big two, um, and this is nice for you know just to be more explicit about what kind of because you have to specify uh, what types of requests you'll accept. Um, the nice thing about this too is it's it's very readable. Um, you know you, someone can look at this function and say, oh get like that's all, this is what happens when a get request is called. You know. It's, uh, this class-based approach like, is very, very modularized, very self-documenting, um, but it, it also helps, it also re sort of requires more background in class-based views themselves, whereas functional views, you only really need to know how to program in Python in order to understand how functional view works. Class-based views, you sort of have to know how to program in Django. Um, so this is another big, uh, big plus for class-based views in my mind is that you have a shared scope. So a lot of times you have uh, common functions, common actions that you need to happen, um, that you need to make happen on a request. Um, and one of the problems with them is like, so here I've got a, a functional view called my view, and it does a few different things, and uh, let's say so blog context is a function that could be called by lots of different views, for example, but maybe it needs lots of specific things from this particular view, so you end up passing through like the name, the user, an object, uh, some other uh, attributes that you use for configuration, like lots of these sorts of things, and you end up passing through just a whole host of parameters to a function. Whereas with classes, um, you just put all of that on the self object, uh, so it's stored on the instance of the class, and then uh, you have access to that in any of the class's methods, and also in uh, uh, inherited method, inherited classes from that one, which is great. Just I, I've done this a bunch of times programming where you just sort of you start off with a function and then you end up passing 
you know, oh, here's all the variables that I have in the scope of this function, and I need like these six of them in this other function, you know, it, it sort of comes to mind that it might actually be a lot easier if those were just two methods on a class, and that way you could share stuff between them a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's sort of the brief introduction. Um, now what I wanted to do is just go over classes and object-oriented programming in Python, uh, just sort of in a very basic level. Um, um, I hope you guys should have some familiarity with this, um, but I just wanted to get, make sure that we're on the same uh, page with this. So, so this is inheritance. So I've got a, two classes here. Um, the second one, weird operations, extends from the first class. So basically what happens here is the second class has access to everything that's defined in the parent class. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's this sum plus prod method on the second class that actually uses those two methods, add and multiply, that are defined in the first class. So this way, if you have things like that, like add and multiply that you're going to share in lots of different classes, you can put those into a parent class and then uh, bundle that functionality like that. Um, so you'll notice here also that um, both classes define favorite number. Um, and so the second one, weird operations, defines it as two, and that'll actually take precedence over the parent one. So when you extend a class, the so weird operations uh, overrides anything in arithmetic operations that it needs to, uh, and that's pretty important for class-based views. So here's just you know that in action. Um, so favorite number you can see is two. Um, <clears throat> okay. So there's also multiple inheritance. And this is, um, this is using mix-ins. Um, uh, so it basically works the same thing as before, but uh, in Python you can have multiple parent classes for one object. Um, uh, so let's see. Weird error operations extends square mix-in and arithmetic operations from the previous slide, this one over here. Um, so it'll, it'll definitely have access to all of the methods on those classes. But interesting point here is Square mixin defines favorite number, so does arithmetic operations, but weirder operations doesn't. So the question is, which favorite number will you use? Um, because it's not very explicit there. But this is a this is method resolution order. It's a, it's it's pretty important if you're using mixins. So the way to think about it is that it works sort of from left to right. So if you define something here in this function, or in this uh, on this object. Uh, then that one takes precedence. And then after that, this one goes. And then after that, this one. So it's sort of left to right. So square mixin comes more to the left than arithmetic operations. So that one gets precedence when there's a conflict. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's just a matter of what order you put the parameters in. Yeah. So if you switch them around, yeah. uh, you get a different result. So that, that order does matter. And that's, that's pretty important. Um, yeah, and you can see favorite number is the the one from there. Did you have a question? Did arithmetic uh, operations uh, extend object as well? Uh, oh yes, it does. Because then <coughs> won't, it, won't the method resolution order have square mix in object, arithmetic operations object? So won't that throw an error because objects in two places in the MRO? Uh, no. It, it, uh, object is actually in the in the inheritance tree, but it, that won't throw an error. This is this is valid. Um, one thing that might kind of make you twitch a little bit is um, I refer to the multiply function here, uh, or multiply method, and this actually isn't defined on object or square mixin. So square mixin does not have a multiply method, um, and that's a little bit a little bit weird. And that's why this is. Um, this is specifically a mix-in. This, this class is not meant to be used on its own at all. Um, and it's only meant to be used in situations where you will have access to this multiply method. Um, and that's, that's defined over here. Um, so uh, so that, is, that is allowed. Um, and it, it's a little bit weird because it's not very explicit. Um, but it, it, uh, you can use that to, to do some nice things with class-based views. I'll get to that later. Um, do you have any more questions about inheritance or multiple inheritance? Yes? What's the advantage of making uh, square mix in a mix in? Instead of, since it needs multiply, making uh, square mix in be based off of the arithmetic operations and then 
weird or awful. <coughs> yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, <coughs> um, well, so this way, I guess, square mixin can use could be uh, used with multiple parent classes that all define multiply. Maybe they define it in different ways and things like that. Um, but it's, it's just a little bit more uh, separated. And, and in a lot of cases, you would probably want to extend arithmetic operations further um, and then go down like that and add another level to the tree rather than going horizontally. Um, but there, there are different situations where each one is a, is, is a better choice. OK. Um, so super. Uh, super is another really nice concept with object-oriented programming. <clears throat> so, um, so this one, this is the same function from the last slide. I just copied it over. The same class, weirder operations. Um, and then right here, I just extended that class one further. And I'm using this thing here called super. So basically, um, what super does is it gives you what it gives you the the results of that method if, if it hadn't been defined in this class. So ridiculous defines random operation, um, and so does weirder operations. But using super, you can actually get the weirder operations version of random operation in ridiculous. Um, that's why I've chosen these names. It's, it's really complicated, really uh, convoluted. Um, <clears throat> so this is nice if you, if you want to override this method, but you also want the prior functionality available in it. Um, so this syntax is sort of uh, difficult to read. I think it changes a little bit in three in three three or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically, you know, you refer to the parent class here, or the you refer, refer to the class where you're defining the method, pass in the self object, and then call the the method that you wanted to use um, with the same parameters. Um, so here, so squared sum is basically the result of this, and then I can do more stuff to that, like add pi or whatever. Yes? Well, that syntax suggests you could actually call other classes and other instant variables, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, yeah, you, usually, I mean, this is like very common with it, but yeah, I believe you can also do with other things. And I think Python 3, uh, I think they simplify that a little bit more if you are just using the, the same class. Um, so here's, uh, here's another, Scrapping the algebraic example, uh, here's some here's another use of super. So I'm taking three classes: um, class A, class B, and class C. Um, and each one of these classes has a function called print name, which just prints the name of the class. Um, so class B and C here call super, and class A doesn't. Um, so if you create an instance of class C and then call print name. It'll print. It'll follow through all three of these things. So class C calls super, and it'll go to the class B definition of print name. And then it'll go to the class A definition of print name. Yeah. And um, in the class B definition, there you've got a call to super. Would that not try and call the print name on object? Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is another. Um, Class B here, again, has to be used like a mixin. So if you use this by itself, you would get an error for calling super there. But because it's used in here where you do have another class after it, then it'll work. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that, that is a, so that, that's why I didn't put it in here. If I put it in class A, that would have erred. Um, so yeah, th these kinds of things get a little bit complicated. And you don't need to use them that much. But you definitely need to know how super works um, for uh, if you want to override the functionalities of parent views and things like that. <clears throat> um, and just as a, to solidify that, I just, this is the same exact thing, except uh, you can see at the bottom there, I just uh, moved the print until after the super. So this time it calls super, and then goes up to class B, and then class A, and then comes back and prints the name class C. So you get B, A, C, whereas before you got C, B, A. So you can do a little bit of control of the, the order that stuff happens um, by where you put the super call. Um, okay. Uh, do you guys have questions about that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's uh, that's it for the object-oriented programming review. So onto Django class-based views. 
So something that I wanted to make clear is um, you can use class-based views in Django without using Django's class-based views. Um, or you can, uh, probably the best way to do it, I think, is if you're, you can use the base view class, but you don't have to worry about the generics unless you want to. Because a lot of times the generics are, if Django provides a set of views that provide lots of functionality that's really common, a lot of websites will use it, but um, you sort of end up, <clears throat> if you want to do something that's pretty unconventional, you end up fighting uphill a lot of the way. Um, and in that case, it might be better to just start with a more basic level. You don't always have to use the generics to use class-based views. It's class-based views are more about that, <coughs> or more about that functionality of uh, transferring uh, parameters across uh, functions and things like that uh, that we talked about at the beginning. Okay, <coughs> so this is a basic usage of a class-based view. Um, so this is your URL config. This is how you call a functional view. I'm sure you guys have seen this if you've done the Django tutorial. Uh, class-based views, the way you typically do it is you import the class, uh, the view, and then uh, call its asView method here in the URL config. And uh, I'll get to where to what that is in a second. Um, <coughs> but for now, you can just sort of treat that as a pattern on how you bring that into your URL config. And then in your views file, this is uh, just that same hello world example from before. <coughs> um, yeah, this, this is all very basic stuff you can see on the Jenga tutorial for class-based views and all that. <coughs> so this is, uh, this is the generic view. This is the base class. All of the other cl generic class-based views extend from this one particular view. So if you do want to stray from Django's generic views, I would still recommend basing it off of this view uh, as your core, because it, it doesn't really implement a whole lot of functionality. Um, it provides that asView method. Um, which essentially just returns a callable um, that you can that you can use in the URL config to start the request process, um, and then it provides this dispatch method, um, <coughs> which I've copied here. So this method is sort of the main entry point for uh, for class-based views. Um, basically, what it does is it looks for it, it looks at the request method, so you get a get request. And then it looks for a method on your class called get, and then calls that method with the request parameters passed through. Um, so this is just sort of, it's like one step. So you have the URL config that routes uh, incoming requests by the URL, and then this dispatch sort of routes them further by you know get, post, put, delete, whatever. Um, and, and you can actually define, and then you just put a get method or whatever, and it'll, it'll take care of it from there. So that's sort of where that bit of magic comes from, is this, this method right here. <clears throat> oh, and uh, a critical thing of this, because dispatch is the main entry point, if you want to do stuff like uh, shut down a view to make sure that only uh, logged in users can see it, for example, you can put that functionality in here. Um, and I'll, I'll go over like, how to decorate this with the, you know, later. But, but this is like the base place, so if you want to do some, like, before anything else happens, do it now, like, that's where it goes. Um, <coughs> okay, so uh, generic views. So um, back prior to Django 1.3, there were functional generic views, and they were actually still available, I think, in 1.3 and 1.4. Um, <coughs> and uh, the issue with those was that, you know, so you have a view that's called, um, uh, you know, object list view or whatever, um, that would return a list of objects. Uh, any, any configuration you wanted to do in that view had to be done in sort of a, you know, you, you would just add a parameter to the function call. Uh, and then, so lots of people wanted to do other stuff. They said, oh, I love these views, but I want to be able to change the template name. So then you pass template name in as a parameter, you know, lots of things like this, and it gets very complicated. Um, and basically, people kept on putting in requests for more parameters, and it just became kind of ridiculous. So class-based views let you uh, define those as, so you can take that parent class and then override anything you need to. So there are lots of sensible defaults for pretty much everything, um, but if you do want to override something, you inherit, you extend the class and then override it rather than interacting just through the parameters of a function call. Um, <clears throat> so they're also uh, extensible and reusable, which is really nice. So if you do, 
you can make, you can take a generic view and then add your one little change to it that you want, say, site-wide, and then you can extend from your version of that thing instead of the parent one, um, which is really nice for you know stuff like where you do want to uh, check for permissions and things like that before allowing access to certain parts of your site or whatever. Um, and also they use the, the template method. Uh, this is actually the reason they're so complicated. Um, uh, and documentation is really sort of the, what I think the key to understanding these, but um, basically the idea is you can, you can, they want, they want to make it so that you, if you want to change one thing, you only need to override that one thing. So you don't have to scrap all the other functionality, just get one thing in there. So it's, it's extremely modularized, almost to a fault. You know, it's like, um, okay, you're, say you have an object and you want to figure out the, the name that that object is going to be in your template. So the, what is the context object name? There's a function, there's a method called get context object name, you know, that refers to the class attribute context object name. You know, and you can override it, you know, you can put it at the top there in the attributes if you need, or you can override the function if you need to figure it out dynamically for whatever reason. Um, so that makes it so there's lots of like weird sort of jumping around functions or methods, um, but it also makes it easier to override the default behaviors and only the bits that you need to. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this, so aside from the main view, which you should definitely use, template view is the is the next simplest view. This is this is also another one that's great to use in even your own custom stuff. So. Um, uh, let's see, so this is a website called Classy Class-Based Views, and if you haven't seen this before, I definitely recommend checking it out. This is, this is the way that I became comfortable with class-based views. It basically, um, well here, I'll just go to it. Um, so <clears throat> this is the website. Um, it's got all the views listed in drop-downs here at the top, you know. Um, and so this is the page for template view. So right here it shows all of the ancestors of template view. Um, and you can click on those and see how they work. And then it actually takes all of the methods and all of the attributes from the ancestors and then puts them all here on one page. So it sort of takes this complex inheritance hierarchy and just flattens it out into one thing, uh, which is really understandable. That way you don't need to just you know, keep jumping around in the source and going back and forth. So um, <clears throat> yeah, so you can see even this really simple view. So template view, all it really does is, you know, Return a template. Yes. Are there tools which allow you to take one of these things and generate this for yourself so you can see what the heck you've done easily? Uh, I haven't heard of any, but if you if anybody knows of one, please let me know because I really want this for everything. Honestly, yeah. Um, uh, so you can also see over here to the right uh, where each of these methods is defined. So view you know provides these five there. So this is the dispatch method from before. Um, so get, so dispatch, remember, um, we'll call get if there's a get request coming in. So you'll notice this function doesn't, um, doesn't provide post or put or any of these other methods. So those will just return, you know, HTTP method not allowed because all you want to deal with are get requests. So um, anyway, so dispatch will call get. Uh, and this is the get function there, the get method. Um, and it'll get the context data you know, from this method over here, and then render a response uh, using the render to response method. Um, so that's sort of like the, the base thing. So um, the class-based generics are separated out into views and mix-ins. And um, I'm going to talk about this more in a second. But basically, views are things that define these like get and post methods. Uh, mix-ins don't. Mixins rely on actual views to, to do anything. They basically just provide a set of functionality. So there's this uh, template response mixin, um, which provides this method and this one, as you can see on the right. Uh, and that provides, you know, all it does is give you something called get template names that will give you like a default for template names. So, or actually, this won't give you default, sorry. Uh, it gives you like a render to response method just sort of tools that you can pull from. That's sort of like a library approach. Do you, so do you guys know the idea of like a library versus a framework? So, um, so basically what this is is uh, with a library, you're controlling the main uh, point of execution uh, and then calling 
helpful utility functions here and there. Whereas with the framework, it's a little bit more structured. The framework typically controls the point of execution. You can override things like that. So libraries, you're fully in control, and frameworks abstract away a lot of that control, which is you know nice for a lot of cases if you know how it works well. But it, it can be more complicated. So mix-ins are the libraries, and the views are the frameworks. Um, OK. Um, so yeah, so there's an API focus on this. Um, you know, you've got a, a couple of things up here. You're supposed to, you need to define a template name. And then basically, to make a working template view, all you need to do is, you know, extend template view and then define template name. And that'll work. It'll just, it'll call that template very simple. And if you want to do things like get additional context data, you can uh, override this method and put it in there. Um, so there are these little points of, these little entry points where you can get in and, uh, and control how everything works. Uh, do you guys have any questions on template view before I move on? What do you mean when you say there's an API focus? So I mean, um, uh, so I really like this this website because it does let you see how everything works, and to me that, that makes things easier to understand. Um, but it's intended. I think the class-based views are generally intended to be used just from reading the docs about them. Not you know, so you're probably not going to override like the init function, for example, the init method, or you know several other things like that. So they, they provide these points where you um, interact with the parent one and use, and that's sort of the, the convention configuration kind of thing, um, rather than uh, the sort of library approach where you, you're controlling the flow. Um, any other questions on that? Yeah. And, and the very last uh, thing to, that actually renders it is the render to response, or? Yeah, so render to response here. <coughs> Um, it, uh, yeah, it looks for, it takes a response class, which is, there's the default up here, and I've, I've never had the need to change that. But basically, you just, this works just like the, the other render to response that's used for functional views. You pass in a context, and it uh, turns that into a response. <coughs> um, okay. <coughs> okay, so this is sort of what I was, I touched on a minute ago. So. This is the, the views versus mix-ins thing. So you've got these, uh, this is sort of just a way to sort of conceptualize how everything fits together. So you've got terminal classes, and these are things where, you know, this is the end view, this is the, the final use case. Uh, you don't expect it to be extended any further. It works as it is. Um, and then you have the non-terminal classes. Uh, so these can be the primary ones, which are the views that uh, Django provides. <coughs> And then you have secondary ones that are the mix-ins, and these require primaries in order to operate. Um, so they're standalone, and they, and they might actually modify the functionality of view methods. So they'll typically provide tools that you can pull from, and some of them will actually like there's a there's a, a, a third-party library called Django Braces, and there's a a mix-in there called CSurf uh, Response Mixin or CSurf Mixin, I think it is. Um, and all you do is add that as a mix-in, and it'll protect your, it'll flag that view as like uh, CSurf protected. Um, so you can modify things like that with mix-in, but they do need uh, primary views in order to operate. So these are a couple of the, there's some of the generic views that you have access to. Um, view and template view we've gone over, those are the basics. Then there's detail view, which uh, looks up an object and then returns that object to the template um, so you can access, you know, say you want to, that's typical for like, a, you know, a blog is like the typical example for all these kinds of things. So you have a blog post as your object uh, and you can pass that through to a detailed view and then it'll, you'll have that blog post available in your template. Um, I think I'd give an example of that in a minute, but it's, it's basically very, very simple. You just extend detail view, say the model name that you want to look up, and um, it actually provides, um, well, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, so then there's a <coughs> list view, which is similar to, to detail view, except it, uh, it finds a query set of objects, so many objects. If you have like, this would be the index page on in your blog, you know, you want to see a list of all these blog posts. That's what list view does. Um, and uh, create view, uh, and up create view and update view will basically use um, the default like model forms 
So you can use Django Forms um, with those two views to update a model. So these kinds of views work really well if you're doing stuff that's tied to the Django ORM pretty closely. Um, um, <clears throat> yeah, and then there's form view, which is similar to those two, except it doesn't require an object. That's just, you pass in a form. You can actually pass in your own form too to create view and update view if you don't want to use the, the default model form. Um, but the, again, the, the idea with these is sensible default. So you know, you're probably not going to need to do much work overriding the form, so you can just uh, not even create a form for that model, and these views will create it for you. Um, there are a whole bunch of date views too, but I've never really use those much. It's sort of like filtering stuff by date and you know that kind of stuff. Um, so this is <laughs> these are this is the actual uh, hierarchy of the Django class-based generic views. And it's kind of a rat's nest, you know. It's it's a little crazy, and this is why it's such a controversial topic because you know it's pretty difficult to wrap your head around this. You know, it takes a little bit of work. Um, which is, so basically the thing with these sorts of views is once you know how to use them, they're great. And then you can jump into somebody else's view and you know, it's very familiar, you know, it's the framework approach, you know, you know how everything fits together. Um, and you can see, oh, he overrode this thing, I know what that does, you know, pretty straightforward. But if you're new to them, like this is pretty overwhelming to understand this whole hierarchy. Um, so you can see anything that extends view, these are the primary views. Um, and then you've got lots of mix-ins in here that just sort of, some mix-ins, you know, combine other mix-ins and it's, you know, um, pretty convoluted. Um, <clears throat> okay? Uh, so these are some, some common methods to override. Um, actually, but first, um, use attributes for configuration. So there's the default behavior that you configure, like back in the functional view days, you would pass stuff into the function call to do configuration. Um, so for that, you use class attributes. Um, so this is update view that I mentioned before. It's got this big list of attributes here. Um, so some of these things have defaults like, uh, well, so you know you want to pass in a, a template name. Um, you can pass in a success URL, like, okay, this form was submitted uh, correctly. Where do we go next? You know, these kinds of things that are just configuring the default behavior. You, that's all controlled on the attributes. You don't really need to touch the methods at all. Um, you touch the methods if you need to do more, uh, stray more from the from the default way that it works. Um, and a lot of the a lot of these uh, generic views provide defaults. So right here, there's a PK URL quarg. So this is um, the primary key URL keyword argument. So you're in your URL config, in your URL config, you're gonna capture. Uh, say, so say it's a blog post again, and your blog post has some ID, like you know, 67 or whatever. Um, you'll probably have, you know, it's a regular expression, and you capture that primary key. Um, so this right here is, you know, what are you going to call that, that captured parameter? Um, so they default it to, P, to PK. So that means if in your URL config you call that captured parameter uh, PK, you don't need to configure it in here. That's just the default, and it's easy to just go with that. Um, does that make sense? OK. Um, and there are a few other things like that, like um, uh, context object name. Like uh, the method for context object name actually does some logic where it'll, where it'll actually come up with a name to call it in the template based on what the model is. So if your model is called blog post, then you'll have access It'll, it'll by default be, to call, be called blog post in your template. And you can override that if you need um, up here. Where was the contact object name? Um, but you know, if you're starting from scratch, you might as well go with the defaults. Um, so, okay. <clears throat> so these are some of the methods that are useful to override. So there's dispatch. I mentioned or that earlier. You might override that if you want to do some you know, control access, things like that that are that are core to the to protecting the view or whatever. Um, get and post are you know pretty straightforward when you would want to use those. Um, get object and this is the this is the method that looks up the object. So in the previous example, remember it's gonna your URL parameter is gonna capture something called a primary key or PK. Um, and it actually fun fact it'll also look up if you call it ID that'll also work. 
Um, so get object will you, so you you specify the model class. So I'm looking for you know instances of the blog post model, uh, and then you specify it in your URL config. This is the primary key. So with that information, the class by default knows how to look up that primary key on that model. So you don't need to specify, you know, find this object somehow. It just does it by default if you correctly uh, specify the URL parameter and the model. Does that make sense how that works? Um, okay. So for simple lookups and things like that, that's, that's great. Uh, but if you want to do something more complicated, um, you know, maybe you didn't want to have the primary key in there, or you just want to, you know, some other kind of smart lookup, you can override get object and, and provide your own way of doing that. That's totally fine. Um, get query set. <clears throat> so get object actually uses get query set. So um, if you're familiar with the with the Django ORM, the query set is just you know uh, a set of all possible objects uh, that you're looking through. Um, and you know maybe one one case you can do this is uh, say you want people to only modify blog posts that they wrote. Um, so in get query set, you could filter uh, blog posts to their blog posts. And that way, um, you wouldn't have to worry about them accidentally editing somebody else's blog post or whatever. Um, get context data. This is, a <clears throat> this is probably the most commonly overridden one. So if you want to pass additional stuff to the template, you can override get context data. And this is really nice if you have a, say you have template variables that you want accessible site-wide. So you know maybe it's stuff that's in your menu bar or whatever. Um, you can define a parent class that overrides get context data and uses super, so it doesn't actually do any destructive overriding. It just takes the default and then adds to it. Um, and in there, you can put in uh, whatever kind of site-wide context you might need, and then any any things that subclasses anything that subclasses that view uh, will have access to those things, and then you can override that further adding on top of it, not destructive override, um, and do stuff that's specific to that particular view. Okay. Um, and these next three are, are for forms. Um, form invalid gets called if your form is invalid. Um, pretty straightforward. Form valid is what, what happens if your form is valid, and um, the default behavior is go to the success URL, and you can also override that if you need it dynamically figured out rather than, remember you can use attributes for configuration. So if you want to automatically go back to the home page, you can just put that in an attribute. But if it needs to be programmatically de determined, you just override get success URL and it goes in there. Do you guys have questions about this part? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so update view, this is the, the one that I showed up on from ccbv.co.uk before. Um, so this is actually a working example of update view. Um, so I, I extend update view and update blog post view. Define the model as blog post, and you know you, you inherit that from your model stuff high or whatever, or uh, import that. And then um, that, that that those first two lines are all you need to work for it to work. But you know it's pretty standard that you probably want to filter the query set to only show results uh, by that user. So here, I, I'm actually just taking the default query set um, and just filtering it. But you can also just you know, skip this default part and then write the whole thing yourself. But this is nice because they already you know, figured out how to get it from the model and everything, and you make some model and, and all that, and you can just uh, filter it further. And this is also nice if you are going to extend this. Um, you, can, you can actually have like several levels of views that all extend this and that all further filter query set. That's kind of a contrived example, but um, you could, in theory, just do multiple filters on top of it, each defined in separate views if you needed to for whatever reason. And uh, query sets are lazily evaluated also, so that won't be a whole bunch of different database calls. They'll, they'll all work together. Um, yeah, so I said uh, get context data. So this is get context data again. Uh, and you, so you notice here, there's no name over on the right here, which means that this is defined in actually three different mix-ins. Um, so this is sort of a, a convoluted example. So this is the base one. You know, anything, if you just pass in 
you know, quarks to this thing. They'll get added as context data. And then single object mix in inserts the single object into the context dict. So basically, this um, does that object lookup and then adds that to the context. So where's the super call? Yeah, so here's the super call. And then uh, it just <laughs> passes that in there. So this one uses the functionality of the previous one and just adds to it. Um, and this is the same thing on top of that. It passes in the context object name to the template. Um, or it, it passes in the object again like by the, the context name. Um, but yeah, so that's just sort of an example of like multiple mix-ins, you know, uh, adding behavior on top of themselves. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I guess that's, I think that's kind of the basics of how class-based you work. I'm going to go into more specifics as well, but um, do you guys have any questions before I move on? Yeah. Um, how readable are these views for the next person who inherits this project? Yeah, so that's sort of the, the big issue. I mean, like this view, I think is very readable um, if you know how update view works. So it, it's sort of, this is a convention versus configuration thing. Um, it, this relies a lot on convention, you know. So if you're using the Django generic views, you know, if you wrote this view, I could look at it and say, oh, this is an update view. Looks pretty straightforward. All that he did that's unusual is uh, filter the query set, you know. And this is only, so what you're putting in this view here is only the way, the way it deviates from the convention. Um, so in that regard, I think it's pretty readable. But if someone is new to Django, or specifically Django uh, generic views, it, it's, it's a little bit less readable because they have to, to figure out how all that works. Yeah. It's all obviously dependent upon how much documentation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It can also be tough. Uh, yes, maybe it's readable, but maybe it's not that maintainable. For example, I had a situation where I had a form view that was using one model, and I wanted to extend it so that it showed data from two different models in the form. Mm. And I think I ended up having to rewrite it to be functional to, to achieve that. There were some. Some people have published some uh, external libraries that let you do multiple models in a model mm -hmm. model form. Um, but I ended up getting rid of the class-based view in that case. I've been so through the same terrible. process where yeah. I wrote something that I was really, you know, that was efficient, yeah. that I liked, but then I backed out um, <laughs> and rewrote it back as a function because I, I wasn't sure that, that Yeah. So the moral there, I guess, is readability isn't everything. There's also maintainability. How yeah. long is this going to last? So I, I think in those situations, that's very. I'm actually going to mention something very similar to your example in a minute. But um, um, I guess what I'm, one thing you can do is instead of going back to a functional view, uh, you can go back to a simpler class-based view. So don't try to use the generics. You know, if it if it gets too, if your use case is too different from them, and you can just extend template view or whatever the minimum you need is, um, and that's uh, it's sort of like a compromise, I guess. <coughs> um, Okay, so decorating class-based views, um, you import this method decorator, uh, and then you can just pass in your normal decorators to that, uh, and you typically decorate the dispatch method, because again, that's that, the first entry point, and if something needs to be blocked, you block it here. So here I just you know, decorate the dispatch method, and then call the parent thing as if I hadn't overridden it at all. Uh, so I'm not changing the behavior of the dispatch method at all here, I'm just calling the, the super version of it, um, but, but decorating it. Um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, uh, yeah, so this is um, uh, another way you could do it is if you, so this is option one, and this is option two. Um, and here I'm using the CSERF exempt mixin, um, and then that, that actually provides that exact functionality. Um, and I wrote here, remember to put decorator mixins first. And this is because of that you know, order, method resolution order that we talked about. Um, so the further to the left it is, the, the earlier it happens. So, you know, you can define it right here in the view, or, you know, barring that, you can have it be the first thing that you're going to use if you need it to be uh, a decorator. Okay? Um, yeah, so these are some, some trouble areas. This is there's no generic view for multiple forms or multiple objects. There's list view, but um, not different types of objects. Um, so multiple forms is a big headache if you're trying to use the form view. Um, 
in that case, I, I would either do a functional view or do a, I would actually probably do like a, another class-based view, but just based on template view, and don't even try to use the functionality from uh, update view or whatever, just because it's gonna be such an uphill battle. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, don't strain yourself too hard to fit the generic use cases. Remember, you can use class-based views and get a lot of those benefits, um, even without the benefits of the generics. So there's more to class-based views than Django generic class-based views. Um, this is another uh, solution, is take control of the flow of execution when needed. So um, you can take so this is a, if it gets too complicated to try to override all these different pieces here and there, you know, maybe it makes the most sense for you to define your own get method. You can either extend a view that has the get method defined and just override it completely, or you can, you know, pull in some of the generic mixins. All those mixins that, that went into creating update view are available to you if you want them, and you can just, you can just pull in all the mixins and refer to them separately without needing to use the uh, the, the actual flow of execution, which is defined by the, uh, the get and the post and all that. Um, so this is, yeah, this will, these first three things I think will let you avert a lot of the headache that comes with using class-based views. Um, I kind of talked about these two points earlier already. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so that, I guess that's the main thing, you know, you just want to Use the generics when they when it makes sense to use them, or if you see like a you know a simple way like oh I just need to override this one little thing, do it, but don't get, don't kill yourself about it. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to go over a couple of external libraries that are really useful. Um, so there's Django Braces. Oh no, um, all right, this is a small monitor. Um, <clears throat> so Django Braces is a fantastic library. It just provides a whole bunch of these mix-ins, really straightforward to use. You just throw them in there and, and they, they just provide useful functionality. So let's say you've got, there's the CSERF exempt mix-in, that's where that comes from. You just put that in there and then your view is CSERF exempt. Um, you can, there are multiple you know, permissions mix-ins, things like that. You know, and those ones use class attributes like to configure what permissions you're trying to specify and all that. Um, uh, this one's really nice. JSON response mixin um, and AJAX response mixin. And this one, I actually wrote this one, uh, JSON request response mixin. So you can use, <clears throat> one of the nice things about class-based views is you can, you can use the same view to return JSON or HTML. So say you have an API and you have all the logic for you know, filtering query sets and getting the appropriate objects and all this stuff. And you know, in some cases, you want to display an HTML page to the user on the website. But maybe you've got a mobile app also, and you want that exact same stuff in JSON to be sent to a mobile device or an API or whatever. Um, all you do is, you know, you'd have get method, and then you could also have a, you know, get AJAX method or, uh, you know, something else uh, where you determine where you want to split it, and then instead of render to response, you call, you know, render to JSON response. And it'll it'll do that all for you there, and that's provided. You can get that here, and there there are also uh, uh, API libraries that are specific to creating APIs. But um, this is one of the one of the really nice, really powerful things about them is you can you can often adapt um, views to do both of those things. So this one, <coughs> this is a pretty interesting one. These are uh, vanilla views. This is a project to sort of simplify. If you remember this tree from before, that's just the convoluted mess of Django's generic views. This is vanilla views tree. So it provides all of the same functionality except for the date views, because nobody uses this anyways. Um, but it's a much simpler hierarchy. Um, and I haven't used these much, but uh, I've heard a lot of good things about them, and they seem pretty cool. Um, so if you want to use some generics but don't want to learn that whole messy hierarchy, this is something worth looking into. Um, but I will add that um, <coughs> You can see they, they don't use a lot of the mixins uh, from, uh, from the Django generic views. Um, so it might be a little bit harder to override you know, random specific pieces of functionality. You might need to override more at once because there is less modularity in it. So, you know, uh, blessing and a curse. Um, okay, uh, yeah, that's it. Um, oh, and yeah, I'm, I'm working at a company called Damagi. 
Uh, we do Django in Central Square. Uh, it's an awesome company. Uh, come talk to me about them afterwards if you're interested. I have business cards. Um, they're really cool. I'm going to India tomorrow, actually, for work. Uh, I'm really excited about that. Be there for a few weeks. Um, yeah, talk to me after if you're interested. So, um, do you guys have any questions about class-based views? Yes. Do you know what the future of class-based views in Django upstream is? Uh, I don't. There, there's a lot of uh, publicity lately because one of the Django core developers said class-based views are a mistake. Um, you know, so they're definitely pretty controversial, but I, I think they're going to stay in there. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know much about that. Yes. In what instances would you go straight to a functional view? You yourself when you're coding. Um, sometimes really simple things. If I just, you know, uh, if it's just like a stupidly simple thing that just, you know, I take in a request and just return like one thing right there. Um, functional view is fine. Yeah. For more complicated stuff, I would, because I mean, honestly, I think um, if you're extending like view or template view, it's not, it's like one or two lines longer than using a functional view, and I would usually just go to those. Because like, I think a, a, a use case would be like, you know, if you start off in a functional view, and you end up using, you know, referring to lots of other functions and things like that, um, eventually it'll just get to a point where like, I'm passing the stuff, the same stuff around, I want these all as methods on a class instead of separate functions, you know. Um, but yeah, for, for really simple one-off things, like functional views, are, I would use those. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, some of this reminds me of when you override the uh, Django admin. Mm -hmm. like if you have a blog system or something and you just want to use the Django admin to provide <coughs> users to write their blogs, and you need to override get query set right. and things like that, when all you're really going to do is say, return a query set where owner is self.request, you know, like mm -hmm. exactly in your example. And that's a little odd and unreadable for people that don't know I mean, how that works, just right? But what if you just put a little comment in there at the beginning of that method mm -hmm. that says, this defines what objects are available mm -hmm. to the admin? I mean, does that, I mean, I, I, is it really that bad of a thing? <laughs> um, Comments no, are always good and helpful. Yeah, I'm, I'm very pro-comments, and some people are anti-comments, but that's not me. Um, but there actually is a project that you might find interesting called um, Django Admin 2. It's a, a Daniel Greenfield, or whatever his name is. Um, one of the Django core developers is, is spearheading this project that to do a complete rewrite of the add-in to use class-based views um, so that you can override those sorts of things a lot easier. Because currently, you know, accessing the add, or if you want to, you know, uh, change the default behavior of the admin. It's a lot of you know, passing parameters into functions and doing sort of this configuration kind of stuff. Um, and it'd be nice to just, just say, you know, I'm just going to take control of this and do what I want with it. Um, so I think that's sort of the goal behind that project. You know, the, the similar um, comparison for me is uh, using model forms versus forms. Mm -hmm. Model forms are, are class-based, and, and, and initially they I always find that you know they do the simple things that they want them to do, but it very quickly becomes a test of my class-based <laughs> programming knowledge yeah. to get them to do to override to get them to do the, mm -hmm. the exceptional things. And then, yeah, um, and I, I do think that's where you know sometimes it just makes sense to to try to you know force it into the library approach where you where you control explicitly what happens and just use the functionality that it provides where you can rather than trying to you know, strain yourself to override the little snippets where you're supposed to override them, you know, and just, just take it over yourself. But you have to have a pretty clear vision of the, of the future of that feature. Or that, or that <laughs> you, you mean to take it over or to... Or, or to make that decision. Yeah. What, whether, um, yeah, I suppose that's true. Cool. Any other questions? Great. Um, I hope this was helpful. Um, and I'm sure I'll get to see some of you guys at the bar afterwards. If you, uh, uh, actually, I think before you go, we've got to, John is going to raffle off some of these books here. Um, so stick around for that. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> we've got some more Riley books. Ethan, thanks a lot, man. Thanks a lot.